Okay, so uh, uh, welcome. Welcome, Manjun. Uh, it gives me a great honor to introduce our next speaker. As you all know, our next speaker is a Fields Medalist. She was awarded the Fields Medal in 2014 for uh, uh, groundbreaking new methods. You're on mute. You're on mute. Okay. Okay. So he was uh, uh, awarded a Fields Medal in 2014 for groundbreaking new methods in the geometry of numbers, which allowed him to count, in particular, rings of small uh, rings of small rank and uh, and give bounds on ranks of points on elliptic curves. And he's no stranger to the Mathematical Congress of the Americas. He was a plenary speaker at the first one in Guanajuato. And he came to the number theory session. I was one of the co-organizers then. He came to all our lectures. He brought his student, Arul Shankar, there, who gave a wonderful talk. So I'm very happy that he's here. And he will tell us about some exciting new proof of a conjecture of van der Berden that he just, just uh, uh, discovered. So welcome. Uh, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure. Great pleasure to be back at the MCA. Uh, uh, yeah, as Florian mentioned, I was at the very first uh, Mathematical Congress of the Americas in Guanajuato uh, in 2013, uh, which is one of my favorite conferences ever. It was just one of the most amazing, uh, amazing conferences. And uh, I'm really glad to see that the conference is still going strong. The MCA is still going strong. Uh, it's in Buenos Aires this year. Uh, it's virtual, uh, and sorry that caused some technical problems earlier, but uh, we're all here together, and, uh, uh, and that's great. So thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your patience, and thanks for welcoming me back to the MCA. It's a, it's a real, real pleasure, and I hope the MCA goes strong uh, for many years and gets stronger and stronger. It's a really great, uh, really great idea to have such a mathematical congress uh, for our side of the world, and uh, and to bring mathematicians uh, closer together from both North and South America and Central America. So, so thank you very much. So what I want to talk about today uh, is a very, uh, very classical, uh, classical problem in number theory that's very elementary to state. And if I can just get this to work, okay. So the problem concerns uh, Galois groups of random integer polynomials. So we all learn in undergraduate algebra that every integer polynomial has associated with it a Galois group. And the Galois group of a polynomial I don't know how to get rid of this improvement. The Galois group of a polynomial measures uh, the, how symmetric the roots are with respect to each other. So which roots can map to other roots uh, over the algebraic closure. So the Galois group uh, tells you what the symmetries of the roots of the polynomial are. And there's a famous theorem of Hilbert that says that if you pick a random integer polynomial uh, with 100% probability as the coefficients of the polynomial go to infinity with 100% probability the Galois group will be the full symmetric group, Sn. It doesn't mean that other groups don't arise all. 100% in number theory is different than saying all, right? You can still have an infinite set that's 0%, right? As the coefficients go to infinity. And so one can ask, well, how big is that 0% or how small is that 0%? And so a classical question is to measure that 0% in a quantitative fashion. And, and that's the subject of this talk. Well, how often do Galois groups that are not SN, in other words, symmetry groups of the roots that are strictly smaller than the full symmetric group, how often do those occur? So this, this is a question that goes back to van der Woerden. Is everyone else seeing this yellow improvements there? No. Okay. Yes, we. Yes. I, I wish I could get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I guess there are going to be some improvements talked about in this talk, so maybe it's okay. <laughs> or shall I open it again? All right, maybe I'll try one more time.
Now I have to. All right, how's that? Perfect. Yeah. All right, excellent. So let's look at all the polynomials with integer coefficients. Having, uh, so let's consider them to be monic, and we're going to ask for each coefficient to have absolute value at most h. So let en of h denote the number of monic integer polynomials, f of x equals x to the n plus a1 x to the n minus 1 plus o n plus a n, where all the a i are integers. Okay, so there's a polynomial of degree n. And we're going to assume that each AI is at most H in absolute value. Okay. And we want to know how many of these have Galois group that's not the full symmetric group SN. So that's going to be called EN of H, right? So EN of H is the number of monic polynomials in a big box of size H whose Galois group is not the full symmetric group. Right, so the total number of such polynomials is around H to the N, right? Because they're N coefficients, A1 through AN. And we want to know how many of those h to the n don't have Galois group Sn. So one observation is that there are clearly at least h to the n minus 1 such polynomials that don't have Galois group Sn. The reason for that is that if you just set a n equals 0, then that's a reducible polynomial, right? If you set a n equals 0, then x uh, is a factor of the polynomial. So then in that case, clearly, you don't have the full symmetry group right, uh, on the roots. So you don't have full Galois group Sn in that case. So that means that they're at least h to the n minus 1. right? So this greater than greater than symbol just means greater than a constant times. right? So they're clearly greater than a constant times h to the n minus 1 uh, polynomials that don't have Galois group Sn of the total, which is h to the n. So of the total number of polynomials, which is h to the n here, uh, there are at least h to the n minus 1 that don't have the full Galois group uh, Sn, right? Because you can just set a n equals 0. Uh, and in 1936, van der Waarden made the tantalizing and lasting conjecture that big O of h to the n minus 1, that the order of magnitude of h to the n minus 1 should in fact also be the correct upper bound for the count of such polynomials that don't have Galois group Sn. So in case you're not familiar with the big O notation, this just means less than a constant times. So, uh, so the number of polynomials here uh, with uh, that have absolute value uh, coefficients less than h that don't have Galois group Sn should be at least a constant times h to the n minus 1 and also at most a constant times h to the n minus 1. Uh, so in other words, h to the n minus 1 is the correct order of magnitude for the number of polynomials in a big box. Uh, of size h uh, that don't have Galois group Sn. So that's, uh, that's the conjecture of van der Waarden. Uh, and the conjecture has been known previously uh, for, for small degrees, degrees n less than or equal to 4, due to work of van der Waarden and, and Chow and Diepmann. So in small degrees, we actually know the conjecture. But for general degrees, uh, it has remained open. But there's been a lot of work in higher degrees uh, in understanding, okay, if we can't prove that it, maybe we can prove it's at least uh, smaller than h to the n. So over the years, they've been better and better bounds uh, for general degrees. So first of all, Hilbert himself proved that en of h, the total number of such polynomials with Galois group less than uh, Sn, uh, is at most, is a little o of h to the n. In other words, zero density. So some order of growth that's less than h to the n. Uh, that's implied by Hilbert irreducibility. In other words, 100% of monic polynomials of degree n as the height h goes to infinity uh, are irreducible and have Galois group Sn. And van der Waarden's question was, can we make this quantitative? This little o of h to the n, is it actually big O of h to the n minus 1 or big O of h to the n minus something? <laughs> so that was van der Waarden's uh, question. And in 1936, van der Waarden actually proved the first power saving uh, in the statement. In other words, the first quantitative version of Hilbert 
Hilbert's statement that it's uh, that en of h is really zero percent uh, of h to the n. Van der Waerden made this quantitative by showing that en of h is is at most a constant times h to the n minus something positive. <laughs> it's something that that gets smaller and smaller with n, but nevertheless, it, for every given n, it's this is a positive uh, positive number, and so. Van der Waerden made Hilbert's statement quantitative by saying en of h, okay, what he couldn't prove that it's O of h to the n minus one, but at least it's big O of h to the n minus something positive. So in other words, en of h is less than a constant times h to the n minus some power saving. Uh, and over the years, there have been successive improvements to Van der Waerden's bound. So in 1956, uh, Knobloch proved that en of h is at most big O of h to the n minus one over 18n times n factorial cubed. So the big advance here was that there's no dependence on h anymore. It's just a function of n. So even as the height goes to infinity, the, the exponent of h is just some function of n that's strictly less than n. Uh, in 1973, Gallagher uh, introduced a new technique into the subject. And that's what makes this, uh, this problem so beautiful uh, in number theory is that so many different techniques have been introduced because of this problem. So in 1973, Gallagher introduced what's called the large sieve, which has become a very important tool in analytic number theory. Uh, but in particular, he used it to prove that en of h is at most big O of h to the n minus one half plus epsilon, where epsilon is arbitrarily small. The implied constant depends on epsilon. Uh, but Gallagher proved that en of h is at most big O of h to the n minus one half plus epsilon. So it's kind of halfway there to the conjectured value, which is n minus one. Uh, coming down from n to n minus half uh, is halfway there to Van der Waerden's conjecture. This was Gallagher's proof in 1973. This plus epsilon took uh, 37 years to remove, <laughs> just this epsilon here. <laughs> so in in 2010, so fairly recently, Zywina uh, refined this to e n of h is actually less than a constant times h to the n minus one half. Uh, and this was using uh, what's now known as the larger sieve. <laughs> uh, the larger sieve allowed uh, the removal of this plus epsilon. So this is really now halfway to Van der Waerden's conjecture. From h to the n, which is the total, uh, we've gotten down to h to the n minus half, the conjecture just h to the n minus one. Uh, later in, in 2010, uh, Dietmann proved using resolvent polynomials and the determinant method. Uh, again, different techniques introduced into the problem to do slightly better. So uh, using more algebraic techniques, Dietmann proved uh, in 2010 that en of h is at most big O of h to the n minus 2 plus square root of 2. So if you think about it, this is slightly less than h to the n minus 1 half. So, so that's further progress. And Finally, the most recent progress, just, just a few weeks ago, <laughs> uh, this team from the American Institute of Mathematics, Anderson, Gaffney, Lemke, Oliver, Larry Duda, Chakan, and Zhang, proved that en of h is at most big O of h to the n minus 2 thirds plus a little bit. So from n minus half, we went down to uh, n minus 2 plus square root of 2, and now basically n minus 2 thirds, so kind of 2 thirds of the way now almost to Van der Waerden's conjecture. So this was the state of the art uh, as of a few weeks ago, that uh, en of h, the number of polynomials in a big box of side length base is most big O of h to the n minus 2 thirds, plus a little bit. Uh, it's hard to give the full history of this problem. There have been, there's lots of literature on this problem. I was just trying to outline some of the highlights. So sorry if I missed. Uh, some other references on this. Of course, there have been many, many, uh, many results uh, on Van der Waerden's conjecture over the years. Okay, so, so the goal today, uh, what I want to talk about today, is to actually prove e n of h is big O of h to the n minus one. So prove the full version of, of Van der Waerden's conjecture, uh, and even without an epsilon. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, I now announced this result with a plus epsilon here. Today, I want to talk about how one can actually even remove that epsilon so we actually get the exact correct order of magnitude here. 
So the total number of pol uh, polynomials in a big box of side length h that don't have Galois group Sn should be big O of h to the n minus one. So that's what I want to prove today. So the theorem is that uh, en of h is at most uh, a constant times h to the n minus one. So there are more general versions of the of van der Waarden's uh, question. One can actually separate out this question by Galois group. So more generally, if you have any uh, Galois group G contained in SN, uh, we can let N sub N of G comma H denote the number of monic integer polynomials in a, in a big box of side length H, uh, number of monic integer polynomials in a big box of side length H, uh, such that the Galois group of F is exactly equal to G. So for a given Galois group G, you can count the, how many polynomials have that Galois group. And that's this count here, n sub n of g comma h is the number of polynomials that have Galois group g uh, in a big box of monic integer polynomials of side length h. And we can ask how big, how does this grow? n sub n of g comma h. Uh, and of course, van der Waarden's conjecture uh, to prove that, that amounts to proving that n sub n of g comma h is big, uh, big O of h to the n minus one for every permutation group g that's not equal to Sn. So van der Waarden's conjecture amounts to proving that the number of uh, polynomials in a big box of side length h that has Galois group G is at most big O of h to the n minus one for every Galois group G that's not Sn. And so the problem reduces to understanding this quantity for every Galois group G that's not Sn and showing that that's not, that's not very big for every Galois group G. And then you can ask refined problems. Well, what is the actual correct order of magnitude for each G? And that's a more refined problem. Uh, and the methods I'm talking about today actually give the best known bounds for many individual G as well, most individual G. Uh, but today, uh, the goal will just be to prove uh, the original, just the full form of van der Waarden's conjecture without getting too into the details of what you can do for each individual G. Okay, so the goal today will just be to prove that the total number of polynomials that don't have Galois group Sn is is most a constant times h to the n minus one. Uh, okay, so I'll stop here for a second uh, just to see if there are any questions on the statement uh, of the theorem and the statement, statement of the conjecture. Okay, so that's, uh, problem is clear. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, great. Okay, well then we'll, we'll jump into the proof. Okay, so just some preliminary observations. Uh, the fact that n sub n of g comma h is big O of h to the n minus one, the fact that that's true for intransitive groups. So an intransitive group just means that the group, when it acts on one through n, uh, it's not just one orbit. It breaks up into more than one orbit. That's what intransitive means. And that's equivalent to the polynomial factoring over the rational numbers or over the integers, right? If a polynomial factors over the integers, then the Galois group will act on each factor separately, right? And so you'll get an intransitive group. So the fact that van der Waarden's conjecture holds for intransitive groups was already shown by van der Waarden. Again, using the fact that polynomials having such intransitive Galois groups are exactly those that factor uh, over the rational numbers. And so to prove this bound, you just have to understand how many polynomials, if you pick a random polynomial in a big box, how many of them, what is the probability that it, it factors over Q? Uh, and so van der Waarden actually showed this order of magnitude for those that factor. Uh, and in fact, an exact asymptotic of the form, uh, an exact asymptotic for the number of polynomials in a big box of side H that factor, uh, was given uh, by Chela for an explicit constant Cn, it's really just Cn times h to the n minus one plus something of lower order magnitude. So an exact asymptotic is known for the intransitive groups because we know exactly how many reducible polynomials they are and they really do grow at the order of magnitude conjectured by van der Waarden. And this was actually proven by van der Waarden himself as evidence for his conjecture. So that takes care of intransitive groups that was already handled in the 1936 paper of van der Waarden. So we can assume when we're proving van der Waarden's conjecture that the group is transitive and that it acts with one orbit on one through n. Okay, uh, 
there's another kind of group that was handled uh, earlier by Widmer. So Widmer has given excellent bounds in the case of imprimitive Galois groups G. So what is an imprimitive Galois group G? Uh, imprimitive Galois group G just means that there is no, uh, so a group G is called primitive if there's no way to partition one through N so that uh, when the group acts, it preserves that partition. So that's different than being uh, transitive uh, because it's possible, so it's possible for a group to be imprimitive, but, uh, but still transitive because it might preserve a partition, but different parts of the partition go to each other. So that way it's imprimitive, but, uh, but still transitive. So, so Galois group is primitive if there's no partition that's preserved uh, by, no non-trivial partition of one through n that's preserved by the action of G. Uh, it's easier to understand what primitive means on the level of polynomials. So just like intransitive for a Galois group meant uh, that the polynomial factored, uh, in terms of the polynomial, the Galois group is imprimitive if if the field cut out by the polynomial, in other words, if you adjoin a root of the polynomial, uh, if that contains a subfield, then the Galois group is imprimitive. So imprimitivity detects subfields. So Widmer has given excellent bounds in the case of imprimitive Galois groups by using the fact that polynomials that have such Galois groups are exactly those that correspond to fields having a non-trivial subfield. So you can imagine that this case would also be a little easier because, uh, and a little more handleable, amenable, to get good bounds for, because you can, again, just like in this, in the case of intransitive case, you could reduce it to understanding smaller degree polynomials, because if you have a polynomial that factors, it factors into two smaller degree polynomials. And so you can understand the degree n case by understanding smaller degree cases, right, in the intransitive case, because it factors into two smaller degree polynomials. In the same way, for imprimitive Galois groups, they correspond to polynomials uh, that uh, cut out a field that has a non-trivial subfield. And so again, you can reduce it to understanding a smaller degree field. You can build up to the big field by, by going in steps, go to the first smaller subfield first, and then taking a field extension of that. So using the fact that polynomials having imprimitive Galois groups are exactly those that correspond to number fields having a non-trivial subfield, uh, Bidmer showed uh, that n sub n of g comma h for any such imprimitive g is at most big O of h to the n over two plus two, a huge saving, way better than, uh, than n minus one. So Bidmer proved a bound that's way better than van der Waerden's conjecture for those cases where the field cut out by the polynomial, the field you get by joining a root of the polynomial when it has a subfield, uh, Widmer had this much better bound. Okay, so the point of the slide is that to prove the theorem, to prove van der Waerden's conjecture, it suffices to show that n sub n of g comma h is big O of h to the n minus one for primitive permutation groups g. So we can, we can, we can assume that g is primitive because for all other cases uh, it's been known. Okay, so, so the point of the slide is that to prove the theorem, we, we can assume that G is primitive. In other words, it does not preserve uh, any non-trivial partition of one through N when it acts. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, so in that case, we'll, uh, so we're gonna try to bound N sub N of G comma H for G primitive, okay, G not preserving any non-trivial partition of one through N. Okay, so to do that, we should understand a little bit about what primitive Galois groups that are not SN look like. In other words, what do primitive permutation groups look like? And there is a well-known proposition of Jordan that, that states that if, if G is a subgroup of SN, that's a primitive permutation group on N letters. In other words, uh, it doesn't preserve any non-trivial partition of one through N. And if it contains a transposition, then it must actually be all of SN. So a primitive permutation group, uh, if it's not SN, it cannot contain a transposition. Uh, and roughly how one proves this is, suppose G, uh, 
So suppose G is a primitive permutation group and it contains a transposition. transposition. Well, we can introduce an equivalence relation on the elements one through N and say that I is equivalent to J if the transposition that switches I and J is in G. And that turns out to be an equivalence relation on one through N. And because, and because there is a transposition in the group, that we're assuming that there's a transposition in the group, that means this equivalence relation uh, contains at least a block of size two, <laughs> right? Because there is a transposition there. But then because G does not preserve any, uh, any partition of N, uh, it, and there's an equivalence relation, and it already contains a, a set of size two, it must actually be all of one through n, right? Because if the, if the equivalence relation, G would preserve whatever uh, partition you get from that equivalence relation. And so that, that uh, partition must be the trivial partition. Uh, okay, so that was a, just a quick sketch of Jordan's, uh, Jordan's very clever proof. Uh, so just think about that. It's very, it's very simple once you think about it. So if you have a primitive permutation group and it contains a transposition, then it must be all of SN. Okay, and one consequence of that, and this uses a little number theory, but uh, if f is an integer polynomial of degree n, and you let kf be the field that's cut out by f, in other words, it's q bracket x modulo f of x. So if you have an integer polynomial of degree n, and you take the associated field where you join a root of f, and if the Galois group of f is not Sn, and it's primitive, then the discriminant of kf must be square full. The discriminant of the polynomial must be square full. What square full means is that when you factor the number into prime factors, every prime factor occurs with, with multiplicity. That's what it means to be square full. So it has lots of square factors. In other words, every prime get, leads to a square factor. And this is a consequence uh, of Jordan's proposition together with, uh, with some number theory. Uh, so how does that follow? Uh, if you're familiar, uh, with a little bit of number theory, well, because there are no transpositions in the in the Galois group, every ramified prime inside Kf uh, must be cannot cannot be simply ramified. It must have extra ramification, and extra ramification causes the discriminant of Kf to never be uh, square free at any prime. It must be square full at every prime. So, uh, if you're not familiar with that result, uh, I just want to I just want to point out that primitivity of the Galois group. Uh, of the polynomial causes uh, the discriminant of the polynomial to be square full if the Galois group is not SN. So this is very useful because we've reduced the primitive case and we're interested in Galois groups that are not SN. And then this corollary tells us that the discriminant of the polynomial must, uh, must have square factors at every prime. So there's multiplicity. Every prime dividing the discriminant always has multiplicity. And that's, uh, that's very useful. So in other words, the kinds of discriminants that can occur are rare. And that's what we're going to use to prove Van der Waerden's conjectures, that because square full numbers are rare. So because the discriminants are rare, these polynomials must also have to be rare. Because generically, you don't expect the discriminant of a random polynomial to only have square factors everywhere. So that's, that's really the main idea. OK, so we're ready to prove the theorem. Uh, so to prove that En of h is big O of h to the n minus 1, uh, we divide the set of irreducible monic polynomials uh, where the coefficients are bounded by h. And the Galois group is strictly less than Sn. And we assume, again, that it's primitive. The Galois group is primitive. And we divide it into three subsets. So we divide that set of polynomials into three subsets. OK, so again, let kf be the field cut out by uh, f. So q bracket x mod f of x. That will be our field k sub f associated to f. And let c denote the product of the ramified primes in k sub f. So all the ramified primes, let's take their product. And let d be the absolute value of the discriminant of this field k sub f. Then we're going to divide into three cases. Okay. So delta is just going to denote some very small constant, say 1 over 100. And our three cases are The first case is where c is less than or equal to h, and d is bigger than h squared. So the product of the ramified primes is less than h. Okay? 
So this is, remember, this is the side length of the box, of the box, right? So we're assuming that C is at most the size of the box. This product of the ramified primes is at most the size of the box, but the discriminant is more than eight squared. Second case is where, again, C is less than or equal to H, but the discriminant is less than or equal to H squared, H, well, H to the two plus delta. And the third case is where C is strictly bigger than H and D is bigger than H squared. So if you look at these three cases, you can see that they cover all possibilities <laughs> of C and D. And so we'll just measure we'll estimate each of these sets in turn. And each case will require a completely different argument. But because these three cases cover all possibilities, uh, that will be enough to prove the theorem. OK, so I hope these cases are clear. So, so the first case is C is small, D is big. Second case is C is small and D is small. And the last case is where C is big and D is big. Okay, so let's look at the case where, uh, where C is small and D is big, okay? So in this case, so given such, uh, so given such a field K, right, equals KF, the polynomials F such that KF is isomorphic to K, so let's fix the number field K of degree N, okay, that has discriminant greater than H to the two plus delta. Then the set of polynomials f in this big box, such that kf is isomorphic to k, uh, must satisfy congruence conditions modulo c, right? Because we're asking for the primes in c to be ramified, uh, right? C is the product of the ramified prime. So we're asking f to factor modulo p for each p dividing c uh, in a way that has multiple roots, right? And that's a congruence condition on the polynomials. And you can work out what the density of those congruence conditions are. And it turns out if D is the discriminant of K, the density of those congruence conditions is about big O of something small divided by D. So basically big O of one over D, but big O of D to the epsilon one over D. And so we, we can impose congruence conditions on our polynomials F modulo C to, to impose the ramification that K requires. And the number of such f that satisfy these congruence conditions modulo every prime p dividing c uh, can be counted directly within the box of side length h because those congruence conditions are modulo c and c is less than the size of the box. So you have a, this big box and you're imposing congruence conditions that are smaller, right? Modulo something that's smaller than the size of the box. So, so you can just count that, uh, count that directly because the size of the box is way bigger than uh, uh, than the modulus of the congruence condition. And so we can just do that count uh, directly by hand. And we immediately have the estimate big O of H to the N, which is the total number of points in the, in the box, times the density of the congruence conditions that we're imposing uh, to impose the ramification at all the primes that are dividing C. And we immediately have this estimate. And now we can sum this estimate over all possible values of d. And d, remember, we're assuming in this case is more than h to the 2 plus delta. So if you sum big O of h to the n, 2 to the omega d over d over all square full d, bigger than h to the 2 plus delta, that gives the desired estimate big O of h to the n minus 1 in this case. Because if you sum over all d that are bigger than h to the 2 plus delta that are square full, that's the, that's the key here, is that, that we're only summing over square full discriminants in, the, in this primitive case. And if you sum our estimate that you get by just imposing those congruence conditions over all d bigger than h to the 2 plus delta that are square full, then that, that converges, right? Because you can, you can think of this d as just going over squares that are bigger than h to the 2 plus delta. So if you're just summing over squares, you can think of this as, let's say this is x squared, right? Where x is bigger than h. And so that, that converges, right? And the exponent just goes down by one, right? When you integrate h to the n over x squared, you get h to the n over x, and x is at least h. And so you say 
you say you get h to the n minus one. So that gives our desired estimate h to the n minus one minus delta. We introduce that little delta so that we actually get h to the n minus one minus delta. So it's strictly less than n minus one. So even if we have a plus epsilon there due to this two to the mega d, it's still big O of h to the n minus one in size. So this is the case where the product of the ramified primes in the field cut out by f is strictly less than h, but the discriminant is large because then you can sum over these large discriminants and you're basically summing over just those square discriminants. And so that converges and you get the desired power saving that you want in that case. Okay, so that takes care of case one where the product of the ramified primes is less than H, but the discriminant is bigger than H to the two plus delta. Okay, so now we'll move on to the case where the product of the ramified primes is less than H and the discriminant is less than H to the two plus delta. And that we handle by a completely different method. Namely, we're gonna use the fact that the discriminant is small and we'll use the fact that, well, there can't be too many fields that have small discriminant because we ha we ha there are known counts of how many fields there are of bounded discriminant. And when the discriminant is small, you can't have too many fields and therefore you can't have too many polynomials. So that's how case two will be handled. So that's this case where the discriminant is small. Okay, so this is the case where the discriminant is small. So in this case, if you let K equal KF, the field cut out by F, uh, then K will be a number field of degree N that has discriminant less than H to the two plus Delta. And the number of such number fields K uh, by a result of Schmidt. Uh, so Schmidt proves that the number of number fields uh, of degree n that have discriminant at most x is at most x to the n plus 2 divided by 4. So if we're going to count number fields of degree n having discriminant most h to the 2 plus delta, we just take h to the 2 plus delta and raise it to Schmidt's exponent n plus 2 over 4. And so that gives us big O of h to the n plus two times two plus delta divided by four. I just wanna point out that Schmidt's bound is the best for, that works for every uh, value of n, but for sufficiently large n, there are better estimates known, uh, pioneered by Ellenberg and Vankatesh and improved by Kuvenius, and most recently by Lemke, Oliver, and Thorne. Lemke, Oliver, and Thorne actually proved that you can replace, for sufficiently large n, you can replace this exponent n plus two over four by log squared n. So something much smaller uh, when n is large. So actually these arguments can be improved quite a bit if you assume n is large. But since I want uh, our argument to work for every single value of n, I'm using the bound that we know to be true for every value of n in that Schmidt's bound. So this bound on the number of number fields having discriminant most h to the two plus delta actually works for uh, every value of n. And so we just raise h to the two plus delta to this exponent that works for every value of n, and we get we get this estimate. And now we have to ask, well, this is this is how many number fields there are, right? Of of discriminant at most h to the two plus delta. But now we want to know how many polynomials can be associated to each field, right? How many polynomials can give uh, any given field? Because we are counting polynomials after all. And this is a result of Lemke, Oliver, and Thorne which shows that the number of polynomials F uh, associated to any given number field K that sit in a big box of size H is at most big O of H basically times some log factors. And you can actually get a saving of a power of the discriminant of the fields that you're considering. Uh, but basically big O of H. Uh, so you don't have that many polynomials associated to any given field. And that's enough to get the bound in, the, in this case that we want. So. That's the total number of F in this case, is at most the total number of number fields that can arise that have uh, discriminant at most H to the two plus delta over four. I mean, sorry, at most H to the two plus delta. That's the total number of number fields that you have that have discriminant at most H to the two plus delta. And we multiply that by the total number of polynomials that can arise for each such field, which is most big H times the log factor. And if you think about it, that's actually at big O of H to the N minus one. Uh, for all values of n greater than or equal to seven. For n equals six, you just barely miss, but then you can use this save power saving factor of the discriminant to actually handle then n equals six. 
And then for n less than or equal to five, uh, the exact asymptotic results that are known for the number of uh, number fields of degree at most five, a bounded discriminant, allows you to handle all the cases where n is less than or equal to five as well, because you can, uh, this exponent of n plus two over four can actually re be replaced by just one <laughs> uh, for quadratic, cubic, quartic, and quintic fields. And so in all cases, we therefore get the bound big O of h to the n minus one in that case. Okay, so that handles, uh, that handles the case where the discriminant is small. And so what finally remains is the case where C is bigger than H. That's the case that remains. And that automatically implies that D, right? Because D is square full, D has to be at least C squared. So if C is bigger than H, then D will be bigger than H squared automatically. And that's this last case here. So C is bigger than H and D is bigger than H to the two plus delta. Okay, so finally we consider those F for which the product C of ramified primes and KF is greater than H and the discriminant is at least H to the two plus delta. Okay, so here's how we handle this case. So fix such an F. Then for every prime P dividing C, note that the polynomial F, in order for its discriminant to be square full, the polynomial F modulo P has to have at least a triple root, right? Or at least a pair of double roots, modulo p, because that's the only way for the discriminant at p to be square full. Right? If you only had a single double root, then only p would divide the discriminant. But so you have to have at least a triple root or a pair of double roots for p squared to divide the discriminant. Okay, and we know that our discriminant is square full. Okay, so for every prime p dividing c, the polynomial f will have at least a triple root or at least a pair of double roots, modulo p. And what that means is that changing f by a multiple of p does not change the fact that p squared divides the discriminant of f, right? Because we're saying that f has either a triple root or at least a pair of double roots, mod p. So that means if you change f to any other value mod p, that's the same as f mod p, it'll still have that triple root mod p or still have that pair of double roots mod p. And so the discriminant of that new polynomial f, uh, say g, that differs from f by, by p, it'll still have the property that p squared divides the discriminant of f. Because the fact that p squared is dividing the discriminant of f is being detected by a condition modulo p, namely that f has a triple root or at least a pair of double roots modulo p. So in that case, we say that the discriminant of f is a multiple of p squared for mod p reasons. Uh, so here's a proposition about general integer polynomials that take values that are multiples of p squared for mod p reasons. So mod p reasons just mean that if you change your polynomial by a multiple of p, you're still taking a, a value at that argument that's a multiple of p squared. So here's a proposition. If h of x1 through xn is an integer polynomial, such that h of c1 through cn is a multiple of p squared, And suppose that if you change the arguments by a multiple of p, and you're still a multiple of p squared always, no matter what multiple of p you change the arguments by, then that means that the partial derivative of h with respect to any one of the variables, let's say xn, the last variable, evaluated at the same argument is going to be a multiple of p. So if you have a multivariable integer polynomial h that takes a value at say c1 through cn, that's a multiple of p squared, and say it remains a multiple of p squared if you change c1 through cn by a multiple of p. It always remains a multiple of p squared if you change it by any multiple of p. And that implies that the partial derivative of the polynomial evaluated at that same argument must be a multiple of p. And the proof is simple. Uh, Let's, let's plug in just the first n minus one values of the argument and keep the last variable, xn. Uh, and let's write the Taylor series expanded uh, with respect to the last variable around cn. Uh, then we have that h of c1 through cn minus one comma xn must be, we're expanding it in the last variable, right? As a Taylor series. So that's equal to h of c1 through cn plus a partial of h of c1 through cn times xn minus cn, right? 
plus xn minus cn squared times a polynomial. That's just the Taylor series around cn and the variable xn. And now if you just examine this, okay, if you plug in anything congruent to cn mod p here, this is clearly a multiple of p squared. This by assumption, this first term is already a multiple of p squared, but this is just a multiple of p here. So that means this partial must be a multiple of p if this whole thing is to be a multiple of p squared. So that proves that this partial as claimed must be a multiple of p. If all we know is that we're plugging in xn congruent to cn mod p, for this, this thing to be a multiple of p squared, we must have that this partial is a multiple of p. And then so that's, the, that's the proof. So that proves that a partial derivative uh, must be a multiple of p if, if the original polynomial is taking multiples of p squared, uh, it's taking a multiple of p squared value for mod p reasons. And so applying this to our original discriminant polynomial, which remember was taking a, was, was a multiple of p squared for mod p reasons, that means that if you take the discriminant of f and you take its partial with respect to a n, right? So discriminant of f is a polynomial in a1 through an, right? And it's a multiple of p squared, we're assuming, right? Because we know that the discriminant is square full. And if you take its partial derivative with respect to last variable, that must be a multiple of c. That's what this proposition is saying. So that means the discriminant of f is a multiple of c. Its partial is also a multiple of c. But if you remember, uh, if a polynomial and its partial both vanish, then the resultant of the two polynomials must vanish. And the resultant of f and f prime is just the discriminant of f. So here we're saying the discriminant of f vanishes and its partial also vanishes mod c. Therefore, the discriminant with respect to an of the discriminant of f must vanish mod c. So this double discriminant must vanish mod c. Now what's great about that is that if you take the, so this, remember the discriminant of f is a polynomial in a1 through an, and now you're taking the discriminant with respect to an, that's a polynomial just in a1 through an minus one. So we've detected this extra ramification happening at c, the square fullness of, of the discriminant at c, we've detected it by just the vanishing mod c of a polynomial in a1 through an minus one, not involving an. Uh, that's really the key, uh, key observation here that we can detect this extra ramification of having at least a triple root or at least a pair of double roots just by knowing a1 through a n minus one. You don't even have to know a n. <laughs> you just have to, so this C has to divide this double discriminant, which only involves a1 through a n minus one. And now you can see how the proof will go. So suppose the product of the ramified primes is greater than H and the discriminant is greater than H to the two plus Delta. For such F, the polynomial Discriminant of discriminant of f must be a multiple of c. So c is detected by just a1 through a n minus one. So I call that the double discriminant dd of a1 through a n minus one. Uh, that must be a multiple of the product of the ramified prime c. Now the number of a1 through a n minus one in a big box, such that the double discriminant vanishes, is at most big O of h to the n minus two, right? The reason being that the total number of a1 through a n minus one is h to the n minus one, but if we're imposing an algebraic condition that they must satisfy, then that'll, uh, that'll knock down how many such a1 through a n minus one there are. Uh, and so the number of f, number of polynomials f with a1 through a n minus one, uh, such that dd is equal to zero, is big O of h to the n minus one in that case, right? Because the total number of a1 through n minus one where the dd vanishes is O h to the n minus two, and then there are h values of a n. So we get big O of h to the n minus one in that case. So we can assume that dd doesn't vanish, right? Dd vanishes then as a strictly lower order of magnitude. So dd doesn't vanish. So let's fix a1 through a n minus one for which dd doesn't vanish. Then that determines C because C has to divide DD of A1 through AN minus one. And the number of factors C bigger than H, right? That, uh, that are a factor of DD uh, is, is at most O of H to the epsilon. So, the, so in other words, once you fix A1 through AN minus one, that determines C because C is just a factor of DD and there are limited number of factors of any given number. And once C is determined by A1 through A n minus one, 
then the number of solutions for a n modulo c to discriminant of f is zero mod c. Well, that's just a polynomial, right? So a one through a n minus one are fixed, and now we're solving discriminant of f is zero modulo c. Uh, that's just a polynomial condition in the a n, and by the fundamental theorem of algebra, that has a bounded number of solutions. <laughs> uh, and so you get a bounded number of solutions for a n. So how does this argument work? We're saying we fix a1 through an minus 1. They're h to the n minus 1 possibilities. And then that determines c up to a bounded number of possibilities. And then once c is determined, then that determines a n up to a bounded number of possibilities because you're just solving a polynomial equation modulo c. And remember, c is bigger than h. So if a n is determined modulo c, since c is bigger than h and a n is determined modulo c, a n is uniquely determined between <laughs> 0 and h. <laughs> and so the number of a n uh, is also bounded. And so the total number of f in this case is um, O, big O of h to the n minus 1. Now, there's one subtlety here is that we're getting a plus epsilon. Why are we getting a plus epsilon? Because the number of factors, once you fix dd to be non-zero, the number of factors c uh, of dd is not actually bounded. It can, right? it's, uh, it's O of h to the epsilon. There can be O of h to the epsilon factors. And then same here, the number of solutions to discriminant of f equals zero modulo c is, well, we have, to, we have to apply the fundamental theorem of algebra modulo p for every p dividing c. But c can have a number of factors. And by the Chinese remainder theorem, right, uh, modulo p, they're at most the degree number of solutions. But then by the Chinese remainder theorem, you have to take that degree and multiply it, uh, raise it to the power of the number of factors of c. Uh, that's how many solutions you have modulo c to a polynomial equation. So that gives an O of h to the epsilon there too. So that's why you end up with a little epsilon here and not just big O of h to the n minus one. Uh, but what I want to point out is that you can actually, if you're just careful about uh, how many factors are actually relevant here and how many solutions to an are actually relevant here, you can actually knock away this epsilon. And that is on the slides that are here, <laughs> which I think uh, is a little technical and I won't get into, but I just wanted to show you that the <laughs> Epsilon can be removed just by some technical arguments, but it's uh, essentially the same argument, just keeping track of uh, these h to the epsilons and showing that they actually can be chosen to be bounded. And that can be done by breaking into two subcases. Uh, the first subcase is where there are lots of primes that are big, and the second subcase is where, uh, so here's this is the case where there are lots of primes that are big, and this is the case where lots of primes that are small, uh, and not too many primes that are big. And if you treat those two cases separately, then you can actually remove those two epsilons that we saw earlier. And okay, so these are the these are the two cases. This is where the uh, product of the big primes is small, and this is the case where the product of the big primes is big. And each of those two cases removes the, the two epsilons. Uh, so I won't go into the technical details of that. I just wanted to point out that you can do that uh, if you're if you're just careful about those two epsilons. And and so that's the conclusion. So we've proven that uh, En of h, the number of monic polynomials, f of x, uh, with coefficients bounded up to value by h, such that the Galois group is not Sn, is at most big O of h to the n minus 1. Um, and that's van der Waarden's conjecture. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll stop there uh, and happy to take any questions. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for the great lecture. Now, if there are any questions from the audience,